Okay, welcome everyone to another one of our um, expert webinars where we invite world leading experts in the field of fertility, reproductive medicine um, and reproductive health to give us their insights and expertise um, across um, their areas of excellence. Um, today we are very, very honored to be joined by Professor Bart Fauser. Welcome. Um, we, Pro Professor Fauser is a professor of reproductive medicine, a gynecologist and former head of Department of for Reproductive Medicine and Gynecology. He's also the chair of the Division of Women and Baby at the University of Utrecht um, and the University Medical Center Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, professor Fauser is a fellow of the Royal College of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology and honorary member of the European Society for, of Human Reproduction and Embryology. Um, he is a world leading expert in areas across human ovarian function, especially PCOS and POI, ovarian stimulation, IVF and women's health, um, and has published close to 500 peer reviewed articles. Um, he's one of the most cited um, scholars in reproductive medicine across the world. So it is an, a massive honor, both personally and professionally, that we have just some of his time today. Um, so Professor Fauser, thank you so much for joining us today um, uh, for what we hope will be a really engaging um, session on an area that we both have a lot of passion for, which is the rise of digital diagnostics um, and the future, essentially, of women's reproductive health. Thank you so much for uh, having me, and I'm looking forward to, uh, for sure, it's going to be an engaging uh, exchange of ideas. Great. Well, um, as our as our sessions go, we are, are usually very conversational. Um, I think overly scripted, uh, certainly over our PowerPointed talks lead to a little bit of just a, a, a formulaic approach. Um, and actually, when we had our initial discussion about this, we, we both got quite um, excited about, you know, the areas of just, I, I guess, similarity. But from your perspective, you've had a very long career, um, a very long esteemed career, and have witnessed the rise and fall of many proclaimed promises uh, when it comes to revolutionary changes, um, be that in IVF treatments, be that in um, assessing embryos, or be that in re reproductive and gynecolo uh, gynecological care. Can you tell us from your perspective, um, what is, I guess, the future of fertility? Wow, that, that's a, a very challenging question. It's a minor question. Let me let me start with a focus on on infertility treatment. Uh, um, but when I started my career, I'm not going to reveal uh, when that was. Uh, but then it was basically had the treatment of married heterosexual couples uh, mm. who tried to have children and failed to do so, and then visited uh, first a general practitioner and then a doctor. And this is the very early days of, of IVF, so there were not too many tools, uh, uh, certainly that, that were proven efficacious uh, that we had to treat these uh, patients, but that's how it started. It was a medical diagnosis and a medical treatment, usually done by doctors working in a hospital environment. Now, if you compare that to where we are now, then you realize uh, how huge difference have taken uh, place uh, first in terms of the possibilities to treat infertility and, and for sure IVF is number one in fetal fertilization. Uh, it has uh, developed uh, a long way uh, in the beginning with big steps with different medication regimes and new technologies being used, uh, improvement of the whole path of, of all the steps in IVF. Uh, but the time of big steps are over and now it's much more fine tuning, uh, uh, probably automation, uh, the use of big data, artificial intelligence, uh, um, but it's relatively small steps compared to the early days. And of course, that's not a surprise. It's always like that when something new comes up, major improvements uh, uh, will take place early on. Number one. <clears throat> Number two, as you can see in the beginning, it was basically treatments taking place in hospitals. And to a great extent, that's no longer the case. Uh, certainly, with the focus on IVF, uh, uh, 
indeed, I think now it's the minority of IVF that is practiced in the hospital environment. And you could say the great, great majority of patients don't really need an hospital environment. And of course, it's by definition not so very patient friendly. Uh, so therefore, if possible, activities has been outsourced. Um, that makes it uh, better controllable, uh, easier to deal with. You know, you only have your own responsibility for, for a given program, uh, but also that made it uh, uh, very commercial, if you wish. So money became a big uh, issue. And, and with the risk, uh, no, the, 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 the advantage of being more patient-centered and coming with good results, the disadvantage of that there may be overuse of IVF itself and, and its added technologies. Uh, and more and more alongside this, but it's relevant uh, that you see, of course, the treatment of a heterosexual married uh, couple uh, who want to conceive and, and, and fail to do so uh, that now is a minority uh, and now there are all other sorts of people who want to have uh, children either individuals or, mm -hmm. or couples uh, same-sex couples uh, lbtq uh, so the, the the techniques originally developed for infertility are now more and more applied for individuals or couples which has nothing to do with infertility per se. Uh, they just don't conceive. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting shift between IVF and fertility practices being used solely for the infertile. Um, and now it is definitely much of a, it, I, I will not say that IVF is a choice, but it it is an enabling choice within couples who, for whom a family wasn't, wasn't possible. Um, however, I think there's a, there's a, there's a very gentle balance that needs to be struck between the between essentially something that can become commercialized. I, I often think yeah. that um, IVF, one of the criticisms I have of, of IVF is that it is one of the only medical treatments that a patient can simply request it, apart from possibly cosmetic surgery, yeah. where a patient can go and ask for a treatment without actually necessarily even going through a thorough triage to understand the root cause and there's very there's, there's various different scenarios yeah. as we've just pointed out um whereby same-sex couples don't need to be infertile in order to need infertility treatment or fertility treatment mm -hmm. however I, I think given the over commercialization of um IVF as a field or assisted reproduction as a field it does lend to the like uh, the inability to differentiate between understanding somebody's root cause of fertility. And you say that the, the, the protocols for uh, stimulation have changed significantly and it's much more fine, fine tuning now, but I still think that there is an over um, pr process, maybe like a, a production line with patients when going through IVF, yeah. whereby there is less of a personalized approach to firstly understanding the root cause of their fertility or infertility um, before ever going through a mm. stimulation protocol. I think there's, there's the standard tick box of let's check the um, ovarian reserve markers and let's check the partner's sperm. But there are, you know, when we look at the NIH website, there are 11 different causes listed of female infertility. And yet we don't really thoroughly examine every person down to the lifestyle level, uh, level as well. Before oh, but it, it's true, but, but it, process. Th th there is in, indeed the difficult balance between doing too much or too little in terms of diagnostics. Uh, uh, doing too little is, is sort of not the nihilist approach. Uh, you know, IVF is an empirical treatment and quite often it doesn't really matter what causes uh, uh, the condition. Uh, IVF will do the job. Uh, so and there people literally say you know you better save the money uh, for expensive diagnostics uh, you better save that for the treatment uh, that's one side uh, the other side of course is the more tests you do the, the more chances you will have to have an abnormal result and then it's tempting to say oh i found a problem associated with infertility uh, but that's not really the case you know it can be an association and not, not a causal relationship and all this quote unquote knowledge about causes of infertility this is textbook knowledge 
usually not very well uh, uh, founded based on science uh, scientific uh, data of course if tubes are blocked due to infection then we know the cause uh, why a woman cannot uh, conceive uh, following intercourse uh, but that's one of the rare occasions yeah, for all the others yeah, endometriosis and, and fibroids and uh, now what what else uh, it is not so very clear even including uh, quote unquote ovarian aging uh, markers uh, so on a group level that may give a decreased chance for fertility, but there may be individuals within that group that have a very significantly decreased chance, whereas for others, decreased chances may be, may be minimal. And the, the and challenge, of course, is going from a group that, to an that, individual. Yeah, hopefully that's something that, uh, you know, a more personalized medicine uh, approach to each to treating somebody as an, an individual um, rather than as a group may help. Um, you have published close to 50 papers on prediction models in fertility treatment using, you know, multivariate um, prediction models, which is something that's very close to our heart at fertility. It's exactly what we wish to achieve for, um, uh, for somebody achieving a pregnancy in the absence of, um, of assisted reproduction or, or IVF. Um, I'm interested to hear, to hear your, I guess, your thoughts and your perspectives on the use of digitalization and algorithms mm. for for treatment and, and for yeah interesting question and certainly of course in in the context of e-health uh, i think these represent fantastic tools to move that field uh, forward uh, intuitively of course everybody says you know we we want healthcare uh, personalized that fit our personal needs and circumstances uh, but the paradigm in healthcare even today is still very different uh, this is a call referred to as evidence-based medicine and and this is the holy grail for many uh, also many clinical researchers and that is usually you know you have a big study with many individuals included and then you compare intervention a and intervention b and the one that shows better outcomes uh, is the best uh, in reality, of course, these patients are usually very heterogeneous within a group, uh, and one group may respond a little better than the other, but we all know, all doctors that have been involved in those kind of trials know that when you look in the details, usually even within a given group, the response differences of individuals are huge. Uh, We've witnessed this many, many times. Uh, we, uh, we have a huge research team, um, yeah. an incredible research team of scientists. Um, and one of the initial things that we set out to do was before we make any statement on anything, whether something's effective or not, let's systematically search through lit the literature to see, you know, systematically review it and do a meta-analysis to say, you know, of all of the literature out there on this, is there anything concluding in one way that it works or the other way that it just doesn't work? And almost across the board what is what is the most frustrating thing about systematically reviewing the literature and you'll see this that every time you read a systematic review or meta-analysis the conclusion is all studies are very heterogeneous yes, so yeah. there's just too much all there's not enough proper controlling within the way we do these things and the most impossible thing to control for is an individual patient right we can tell certain parameters about them but you can when it comes to fertility even if you took every detail there was about one person, you still need details about the partner or the sperm um, that, yeah. that, that enables it's even, that. It's, it's, it's more than that. As, you know, it's about difference in lifestyle, uh, ethnic differences, uh, uh, the difference in, in, you know, whether you yeah, whatever live in New York City, uh, you know, you lead infertility care. Of course, that's com completely different than if you are living in sub-Saharan Africa and you need to, and these are just maybe individuals of the same age and they may need the same treatment, uh, but, you know, all the circumstances, the context, I, I like the term, the context is, is completely different. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have to, to indeed acknowledge that. And what you need for personalized medicine is really a different research approach. Uh, and in that respect, what, what you are doing uh, might help a, a, a lot. So we started doing this in the, in the early 90s, uh, where we thought, and also I like that this, uh, the natural 
cause of disease approach. So, you know, maybe even you can give a certain condition a label, but what does it mean? What does it mean in terms of infertility or in terms of bleeding or in terms of quality of life or in terms of future health risks? Uh, and what you need for that is just follow these uh, uh, individuals. So you have a group of women defined uh, based on whatever criteria and you follow them over time. But of course, under circumstances where, where the aim is uh, a pregnancy, now usually within a, one or two years, you, you know whether it's gonna work out or not. But there are many other uh, 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 questions relevant to, to healthcare, to women's health, that may take 10 years of follow-up. Uh, and who's gonna do trials with a 10 year duration? Who's gonna sponsor trials with a 10 year duration? Yeah, but very, very few. And also the whole funding system is not, uh, is not uh, ready for this. Uh, so you need a completely different uh, approach. And, and, and therefore, and I think the fundamental idea here is you don't compare intervention A and intervention B, you yeah. compare patients that all undergo the same. the same intervention like infertility treatment whatever that that is and then you say which are the patients with a favorable outcome compared to which are the characteristics of patients uh, with and, and 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 you need big data for that and indeed in that respect e-health and, and 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 artificial intelligence is going to be hugely uh, helpful and this is also this is not something that uh, we have invented in in the fertility arena this is debated everywhere in all the big journals for cancer treatment, for cardiovascular disease, uh, for preventive mass, secondary prevention. Uh, so this is, this is discussed everywhere and picked up some areas more than others. Uh, so you could say in that respect that fertility care, uh, uh, infertility treatment uh, is, is, is running behind. Uh, we yes. are pretty resistant to change and we always say, oh, be careful because what we do now is great and we, 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 we are re um, reluctant to make uh, changes. But you know, the whole world around us uh, is changing and we, we better be part of that. You've joined the revolution. <laughs> mm. I think you started it a long time ago. Um, yeah, and I think on on to exactly like I reiterate your sentiment about the data. Um, we've we've been perpetually disappointed by data sets um, and how small the data sets are in papers that are actually seminal papers that make big sweeping statements in fact yeah. these are statements that go into um diagnostic protocols they go into diagnostic guidelines um these are the rules by which many clinicians then adhere to in order to diagnose somebody and like you said about the a diagnosis what is a diagnosis and what difference does it make if it if the treatment for that diagnosis doesn't work for a majority or even a minority of patients. And I think we have an over, um, I guess, a desire to put people into a, a bucket when yeah. it comes to a pathology. Somebody is PCOS, somebody yeah. is has endometriosis, when really there are probably many different subclassifications of these. Um, these should be umbrella terms and there should be much more, very many subclassifications yeah. within them so that actually within those subclassifications, everybody gets a much more tailored treatment that would exactly. suit that exactly. classification of PCOS or endometriosis. Yeah, and we may, and I, I like that because diagnosis and, and I, I almost i say privately i have those discussion often that people want to know if there's a problem what is the diagnosis what is the label you know you want to have a ticket this is it uh, that's an illusion that that's not reality uh, you can have a label but if the label doesn't mean much and if it's a container or if it doesn't have any implications for for your treatment uh, then why would you want to have a label at all but it's apparently in the human being the thinking you know we have a problem and i know what the cause is uh, but so also i, I like... think it's, it's it's also to do with people getting to care soon right if if you cannot put a label on it you can't yeah. seem to get and i think this is this is probably a systemic this is a systemic problem within women's health is the inability to get whether it's a label or whether it's a diagnosis, just the inability 
to get to secondary care um, because the yeah. gatekeepers of our care are primary care that, providers. That, like right. and, and that's a very practical, but also to broaden it even more, what is now much debated in my country, uh, and, and I've been part of that debate from the beginning, that uh, the whole issue of women's health, uh, it is clear. And I, I doubt that the UK will be any different, but in the Netherlands, it's well documented that women are worse off in the healthcare system compared to men, because we know less about women disease. Uh, yeah. uh, usually, if diagnosed at all, it's diagnosed later. Yeah. Uh, women visit hospitals more often. Women visit general practitioners more often. They use more medication. They are less happy. They are more often uh, uh, depressed. Uh, now, blah 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 blah. This is not good news. And, and infertility is part of that, or a relatively small part of that. Uh, so the problem is even much broader. We just m know much less about the female body com compared to the male body. And uh, the whole medicine, the way we practice today, is based on research mainly in the 50s and the 60s. And this were all research performed by men, but also the, the patients included were all men. Yes, I know. Uh, it's one of our biggest biggest bugbears we went we took the streets of London with our mind the gender health gap um, placards yeah. because we just felt so uh, annoyed that today still when we send blood samples and, and, and laboratory reference ranges are based off male bloods mm. yeah. <laughs> um, for testosterone and you know these are not, not just male hormones these are female hormones and and yet we have this reliance on you know, the default being a, a male body and anything else is just an anomaly. And, and to me, I think, as um, I, I've said this before, as a geneticist, we expect so much detail for a diagnosis. We expect so much to understand every single thing, whether it's a single base pair change yeah. within somebody's genome. And when it comes to huge issues like women's health and the individual conditions that affect billions of women, the, the 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 rhetoric is still we just we just don't have enough data and i, I just think when are we going to call yeah right so what, when are we going to uh, call that and say yeah. we have plenty of data you're just not collecting it um and plenty of willing willing people and we saw this change in people's attitude yeah. instead of being as you mentioned at the start a hospital is a terrible place for often people get more sick in a hospital because you know psychologically it's a it's not a great place to to be in um obviously there are real reasons for being in a hospital but so much of women's health is very private and personal and so being able to take that anxiety away from them in any way to mm -hmm. enable an at-home diagnosis or test is part of our mission number one but secondly how we actually even began as our journey was that we had started a clinical trial and knew that we needed to recruit women from clinic and so that that whole system of having to approach somebody in the waiting room and say do you mind being part of our study um and they're in this zone of thinking what what do you need from me what do you want from me and and everybody in, if they're waiting in a, in a waiting room to be seen by a doctor for any kind of procedure is in a vulnerable position so we found it really difficult and actually i would mm -hmm. at, at the time i thought unfortunately lockdown hit and we on all essential gynae clinics were closed but now i think fortunately that was amazing because it forced us to be you know resilient and say right how do we recruit women and we put up this website and yes 7,000 women said, I want to know more. And it, that was really what ignited this in yeah. us to say, we can actually enable women to find out about their bodies, but also be participants in a greater movement, which is, you know, gathering insights for it all across, across the board, not just by the time somebody gets to clinic. I think taking information or even blood or symptoms from somebody when they're already in clinic, you've gone too far it's almost too late we should be collecting data from a young young um demographic of women and when they're a little bit older and older again what we repeatedly see um with our with the people who take our test is that when something's wrong with them they invariably invariably will say well i've actually had problems since i was 16 but i was put on the pill or i've actually had problems since i got my periods um but have been you know taking contraception mm -hmm. since so it's only when they come off it to have children that they realize that this was never a necessarily healthy no. reproductive system and that mu way way long ago they should have had treatment or intervention no but it, it, i think it, it it also it represents a shift the, the healthcare system of course it by nature is very reactive 
Yes. You know, we wait for uh, a problem to occur and for somebody to realize, oh, this is a problem. And then they come to us and in the early curative way of thinking, we say, we are going to solve the problem. You know, we're going to diagnose, say what it is, and we're going to fix it. And we're all happy. Uh, that was the classical medicine uh, approach. Now, we know that life is much more complicated than that. Uh, so now, uh, and what you are doing is reach out to individuals who are not sick. Some of them may get sick or may have an increased risk uh, to become ill. But the, And this is more proactive. Than, so then you're early. That's number one. And number two, of course, you, you, you change the balance uh, because once an individual is already a patient, it's the, sort of the old-fashioned doctor relationship. Uh, mm -hmm. and the doctor is here and the patient is there. And now, by being more proactive earlier, it's no longer a patient. Uh, it's an individual uh, a client, a woman, if you wish. So now we are more in the role of a counselor providing relevant information for the problems or presumed future problems of this individual, and also therefore helping women to make uh, uh, well-informed decisions. So uh, change the balance towards more autonomy of the individual. And, and that too is a trend in general healthcare system uh, that people that say, you know, you, it's not your, whatever, your lifestyle and smoking and obesity. And then, you know, you put it on the plate of the hospital and say, you fix it. Uh, you know, it's part responsibility for the individuals themselves as well. So it, 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 it is their problem. We can help, we can counsel, but they should be part of the solution also. Uh, Absolutely. I think that re the, the term responsibility is is the perfect term. We call it re reproductive responsibility. Yeah. You know, we are all responsible for so much yeah. of our life, so much of our lives. We can't get away with not paying our bills, not looking at our finances, not monitoring, yeah. you know, whether we have enough money in the bank to pay for the things that we're going to spend. And yet we don't monitor our ovarian reserve before we plan our, a family. And we plan all parts of our lives, whether it's, you know, your career, your next holiday, where you want to live or a house you want to buy. And and yet we don't plan years in advance. And, and people say we, we, we do. But the reality is, I think the responsibility has really shifted and it's it's almost taken the carpet under from so many women's um, lives because there's an, a narrative among the kind of like, social scientist realm, which is that, you know, women are choosing their career and women are choosing um you know a lifestyle over a family and the reality is we have no choice but to work um we're not living in the days where one income could afford to mm -hmm. even rent a house let alone buy and that i think is is very unfair on the responsibilities really that we've all of a sudden i for, from from a personal perspective it's not a case where women are, women are I guess negating the need or or even ignoring it they're just for many they come up for air in their 30s going i need to have i need to have a baby i mean mm -hmm. I, that's now that's when now, now that's the thing i need to do um and i think that's really put a terrible shift on the then the onus to to do a, a quick fix which is you know go and freeze your eggs do something be responsible which is another financial Mm -hmm. burden for so many women when actually what they should be doing is saying where am I now you know is my uh, am, am, am I reproductively healthy um in as far as we can we can see am I monitoring my ovarian reserve um and 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 while we know there are limitations which we'll get to in a second about you know monitoring ovarian reserve there are certainly um upper and lower limits to where action could be taken a lot sooner and the information that one would get from yeah. testing their fertility or reproductive this health is, would, be, would change one, their path. One ele element which has not been part of the discussion so far is also, and, and I, I like sort of the analogy, the, the family planning. Uh, I think everybody has an idea about family planning and what it means. Uh, usually it's being part of a biology class in, 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 in uh, uh, high school. And that's about sex ed education and about uh, preventing pregnancies. Uh, yeah. But if you think about the term family planning, family planning does not only mean not to have children if you don't want it it's supposed to mean the other side of the coin as well uh, 
So what to do if you would like to have children and which measures to take? Uh, and slowly you see a movement towards, yes, this whole idea should be brought and broadened and should be uh, uh, part of high school uh, education already, that women and men, not just uh, women, the women and men, are aware of I this. I don't know what you mean with... Sorry. Muzi, you must not have to go Just a second. Somebody is trying to help. <laughs> um, so um, people are aware of this at a very early age and, and may want to think about this in, in, in the future, in the near future, uh, uh, testing of ovarian reserve may help uh, that women are informed that uh, uh, they are destined to have decreasing fertility uh, at an early age or at a later age. Uh, uh, it all might help in informed decision making. Then at least you know where you are also at an early age where it's not you know, relevant at that particular moment, but that people can have indeed reproductive responsibility starts earlier, starts before, you know, you, you consider to have children, then. but where am I in life? And you may want to make your uh, life choices um, and, and this be part of that uh, equation. When we, when we kind of, I guess, when we look as well at the, the, the statistics um, around infertility and the prevalence and how many people are affected? You know, one in seven heterosexual couples are affected. And it, it, this is, we, we know that global fertility rates are falling because of our environment and because of, um, you know, the, a, a later trend towards even the, the time that what somebody would start having their family, ha having their family, or even thinking about it. That, to me, suggests that so much more could be caught if we were just thinking more preventatively about it. How many? of that one in seven, was their infertility actually age associated? Yeah. And we know that age is the number one determinant of infertility. Um, and that seems to be, that seems to be the, the growing, increasing trend across reasons for uh, people attending fertility treatment is that they are of advanced age. Um, but there are yeah, many or, who within that group, even at a younger age, they would have suffered so we've we've had 28 year olds, we've had 22 year olds, we've had 25 year olds, all who have premature ovarian insufficiency. And they were, you know, they would never know. It may be that those 25 year olds aren't going to even attempt to have a baby until they're 35, in which case the label is advanced maternal age. So I guess you, they just fall into the, the same trap of just blaming infertility on age when actually That's maybe lovely. a huge portion of those they could have known much yeah. earlier on and they they would i think the had. increased need the increased use of, of of fertility care indeed is as you say uh, that often you know a more advanced reproductive age uh, of, of women and therefore decreasing uh, chances but also but don't forget that there's an increasing demand for fertility care uh, not in the context of heterosexual couples, but by individuals, uh, uh, yeah. male and female, and by same-sex couples and by the LBTQ co community. Yeah. Of course, it varies from country to country, but in the Western world, uh, for sure, this has uh, uh, grown rapidly. Uh, the number of individuals who approach uh, clinics uh, for care in this context, uh, often also uh, cross-border care that they have to go abroad because they can't get uh, the interventions that, that they aim for in their own uh, country. And, and this is uh, about also very much about autonomy and human rights. Uh, everyone yeah. has the right to reproduce no matter what circumstances. Yeah. Uh, so that too is, is a huge uh, shift uh, if you compare now versus 10, 20 years ago. I, I couldn't agree more. It, it's, it's amazing the, um, the ways in which we've been able to bend biology um, and, and move it from a realm which was solely patients to actually individuals with you know, they're, you know, that are maintaining their reproductive autonomy um, through various pathways like surrogacy or egg donation. Um, and I think that, I think that brings us to an interesting point around, around autonomy um, and that, that kind of um, choice versus being told what to do by your doctor, not being told, but being, get, get, I guess you go to a doctor because they're an expert. Um, you want them to have to bring all of their years of experience to the table and say to you, here is here is what the best um, possible route for you is. And on and we've seen that 
there are, because of the commercialization of IVF clinics, that many patients can go and the, the, still the, high, the most common age for freezing eggs is 39. And to me, there's almost level, a level of dishonesty when it comes to um, clinics offering treatments to patients who have poor prognosis. And yet, how do you how do you battle that with some? How do you draw the line as a as a professional who says your chances are pretty low, but as a patient that is demanding something? I think there's been a real change mm -hmm. in the dynamic between the doctor patient relationship, whereby patients are coming armed. And they're telling you what to do. Yeah. Of course, there's not a simple answer to that. Uh, to be honest, in, in my country, in, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, up till recently, amongst many of my colleagues, there was sort of the old fashioned idea that doctors knows what is best for patients. Uh, and, and then the doctor would say, this is a very low chance intervention. We're not going to do it. Uh, but of course, you can imagine that, that many people are not happy with that to say, am I part of that uh, uh, evaluation also? Can you decide for me? Uh, and, and we know that uh, even uh, with very low chances, quite often patients say, I want to have everything possible to be done. Uh, also later on, if it fails, then I know I've done everything uh, possible. So, but yeah. you can see that's a, that's a tight balance. And certainly also in, 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 in that kind of discussion, whether you like it or not, uh, a commercial uh, 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 um, is, is the commerce is, is being part of that uh, discussion also. Of course, if you, uh, practice uh, medicine with a fixed uh, salary for all the so it doesn't matter how many procedures they do it's quite likely that your counseling will be somewhat different than if you run a private clinic uh, where, where you get paid by the procedures done uh, and then we have to take our responsibility as doctors but of course under those circumstances it's easier to give in you know if you if you advise negative it's easier to give in and say okay if that's what you want we're going to do it uh, but certainly also in in the Netherlands to be honest uh, really quite a few patients went abroad because they they insisted on having interventions which doctors said this is not wise and then they went to Belgium or to Germany uh, mm. so that is so it, it is it's not an easy balance uh, it's, sure. it's definitely difficult to balance autonomy versus I guess the cold hard facts um, yeah. and we definitely live at a time where it's much harder in a very sensitive generation of people that it's actually hard, very hard to deliver um, some very hard facts when it comes to the potential success or ev evidential failure yeah. of a given treatment. Um, and that, that, I think, brings us really nicely to the limitations of fertility testing. Um, we, from the very beginning um, with fertility, have never and never ever offered an AMH test on its own. It's something we refuse to do. People have asked us many times. They say, I, I know this AMH marker, um, which for anyone who doesn't know is, is a marker over, over ovarian reserve. It's produced by the um, follicles or the potential eggs within your ovary and there, therefore gives us a, a relative idea of the abundance or lack thereof of eggs within um, somebody's um, ovaries. And so it's used as a kind of a surrogate marker for somebody's fertility. However, one marker in isolation is just simply not enough uh, to give somebody a thorough examination of their reproductive health in general. So when we never we, we always talk about hormone health and reproductive health and not just fertility, because essentially you, ca you cannot extrapolate um, a, a, a substantial piece of information without including aspects of people's lifestyle, their biometric symptoms, potential conditions. And that's kind of what's led us to developing a this essentially clinical diagnostic tool for reproductive health conditions, in addition to giving somebody insights into their fertility. Um, so in your in your experience from, I guess, this ongoing debate about AMH um, not being a sufficient marker to tell whether somebody is is fertile or not. Um, do you agree that it, it is still a very promising candidate when we look at scanning somebody's physically scanning somebody's ovaries and counting um, and comparing that result with their um, AMH level, we see we see concordance across the two. Mm -hmm. um, um, 
And while we say you cannot predict whether somebody can or cannot have a baby above a certain threshold, I agree. However, below a certain threshold, there is no doubting that some, somebody has a very, very extremely low AMH. They will struggle to conceive certainly much more than somebody with a higher AMH. Um, AMH, beyond any doubt, is by far the best biomarker for ovarian aging. Uh, I think there's no discussion about that. Uh, but there again, I think it comes back to the uh, idea about group medicine versus individualized medicine. So if, if you compare two groups of the same age, let's say 35 years of age, and a group with a higher AMH and a group with a lower AMH, for sure the group with the lower AMH will have less chances to conceive, mm -hmm. either without medical intervention, expected management, or with uh, interventions like ART, number one. On the other hand, there again, it's just like what we discussed earlier, within that group, there are huge differences from one individual. So it is good, it's a good predictor for a group, but it's less good a predictor for an individual. So AMH again is the best marker, but AMH alone in terms of fertility counseling for an individual woman saying, what are my chances? Can I just wait or should I, should I? And indeed what you are saying, if it's really low, it is usually bad news, uh, bad in terms of fertility potential, but in the normal to higher range, it, it is more problematic. Uh, the problem also with AMH, I'd like to, to refer to it, it, it's a damage done situation. So when, you, when your AMH is low, mm. it, it, it affects your prognosis. But there's basically nothing you can do about it, uh, mm. except maybe for oocyte uh, donation, uh, but for the rest. Uh, so, of course, the real challenge is to look for markers which can be assessed at an earlier age, whether there are still choices. Uh, and biomarkers, almost by definition, may not be suitable for that uh, but uh, I think it's fair to predict that within now and a couple of years, we will have uh, the added possibility of looking at genetic markers. Uh, and of course, uh, Helen, you're the expert, uh, so you can say with greater authority uh, uh, how this works, but it, it looks like, and because ovarian aging, the end point of ovarian aging is menopause, uh, and the complete cessation of ovarian function. Uh, and we see, Number one, AMH by itself at a young age is not a very good predictor. Mm -hmm. If you do repeated AMH measurements over time, mm -hmm. it increases significantly the, the, the power to be able to predict age of menopause. Uh, that, that this is well studied now, uh, and, and, and that's a clear statement. But also looking at the genetic markers, uh, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, the first studies in this area appeared 15 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe from Rotterdam, uh, by the way, and, and uh, they started and then the whole series. And now already with a, with a series of SNPs combined, you yeah. are already fairly good at predicting age of menopause. So, and I'm not aware of those studies being published yet, but my prediction would be that the combination of AMH and these genetic markers- uh, are Plus lifestyle. Um, yeah, of course, symptoms. next to these are it's, indeed it's markers. Very powerful. In addition yeah. to, so, and then you will get, I think, more and more close to something that is clinically useful at an individual uh, level. Um, and I think what you have been doing with, 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 with uh, fertility is, I think, number one, finding the right language to 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 uh, to reach people uh, i think that, that that's uh, you stand out in that uh, in in being uh, having achieved uh, that uh, and now reaching big uh, uh, and you have the tools to be able to do this prediction analysis uh, because we still we can now speculate and we're based on rational consideration say this is likely to but yeah that's good as a starting point but it's not good enough we need mm -hmm 
data. We, we need, need data. Proof yeah. that this we is are, honestly, data. part of our mantra is, you know, everybody pushes an annual, so, you know, your smear test, your smear test. You should be doing an entire reproductive yeah. health test. Every, everyone should do an annual fertility test. <laughs> that, that, is your, that is your true way of monitoring your ovarian reserve. Some people have, you know, one we've had within the team, even some people have pretty, <laughs> within the team, everybody monitors every month. Um, it's part of our own internal data collection to, um, we have some very, very motivated volunteers to understand exactly yeah. what happens throughout a year and, and the dynamic change that, um, that can happen. But, but for Helen, some people, like that drop is, is significant. Yeah, like we discussed earlier about IVF and 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 the risk for overtreatment and add-ons. It's here as well about fertility tests. Mm -hmm. Now you know better than I, but there are way over one thousand fertility tests being e health uh, tests being developed, and most of them, how to say it politely, is not high quality. Yeah, uh, and in that respect, uh, still people usually are asked to pay for that. Uh, so there too is the risk for exploitation and, 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 and creating expectations that are not realistic. Uh, so like in the F I I IVF, industry so to speak it's also in the e-health industry you know you, you need to take responsibility uh, and, and indeed there are many people that are very skeptical about the entire development uh, I, I, I see it as a great great opportunity to move it forward uh, but only under the circumstances that it's done seriously that expectations are managed uh, and that indeed you take the responsibility to not just be there, but also evaluate what you are doing and building proof uh, how valid uh, this is. I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. It's so often we see, you know, companies popping up and they're led by not to say non-experts is an understatement. They're led by business people who have an idea and see a market opportunity. Yeah. And I find that horrific, actually. I, I, I still don't consider this a market. I consider this global health um, when it's, you know, 51% of the planet and, and we're being told, is there a market for it? I'm like, I don't care what you're talking about. I don't care about talking about markets. These are human beings. Um, and the fact that we don't have the data to me is just simply not good enough. So um We've, we've done our absolute best to get the, the best and the highest quality data. Um, and, and the last point, I guess, around you know, fertility testing is the, the importance of understanding, under, understanding that you may have a high ovarian reserve, but ovarian health is really important as well. And so our, our, our lifestyles have changed significantly from our mother's generation. Um, we are a generation of women who have a lot more choices and, and perhaps those choices are, are leading to... Um, I guess I think I always say we're choked by choice um, at this stage, whereby the, the, the choice to delay um, your childbearing years actually doesn't necessarily serve you. Um, and that when we when we overfocus on a narrative of um, using technology to delay, um, to freeze, to to rely on, you know, well, like it's, it's OK, I've got IVF, I think is, is quite damaging. Um, and as a society, we actually need to really shift in, in such a digital society. There are fundamental, really basic things that we need to change around um, our attitude towards um, work and children. And I, I think it's a huge responsibility falls on the workplace to actually accommodate women to have children, to not be to not to not be pushing women to just it's OK. And the amount of workplaces that that will pay for their female employees to freeze their eggs. Um, and I think that's at a time I used to think that was amazing. I thought it was so progressive. And now I, I think that's the opposite to progressive. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually mm -hmm. I, I think it's actually using women saying we'll, we'll take you for your good years and don't worry, you can have the, the eggs back when you're when we're, we're not when we're ready um, and we're done with you. I think that's the, the narrative needs to be much more around supporting women to think that they get, feel comfortable to have children and, and that there'd be child care. Um, at the ready but it's that's a that's part of a bigger mission i think for us yeah. is, is changing those conversations um so we have just two questions here or maybe they're comments um so i will read those if that's okay um the first is to say the information for online diagnosis must come entirely from the data the patients choose to reveal the advantages lie in availability and speed through automation what disadvantages do you see and how could they be alleviated 
a very good question, and I think it relates to what we have discussed before. Of course, it's up to uh, the scientists to think, you know, what are relevant parameters uh, allowing us to reliably predict uh, future fertility potential? Of course, it's up to the individuals uh, to decide which of those data they would like to share. Mm. And um, science allows us to do um, to do a prediction analysis, even if we don't have the data complete. But for sure, at an individual level, the, the accuracy will decrease significantly. Uh, so if we don't have all the information in the system to make a prediction, it is going to be less reliable. I think actually it, it is an amazing question. One of the one of the biggest omissions from data collection is when people don't realize that something might have an effect um, on their reproductive health and therefore they're not training themselves to understand that input one or whether it's a dietary input or a lifestyle exposure actually has an effect on their fertility. We tend to isolate reproductive health from just general health. Um, and I think that is, again, something that we're trying to get as many metrics as we can um, to see what the effect is on what could be coincidental or what could seem insidious or, or non-related to an effect on your fertility, but actually could have a massive impact. Yes, and it's more and more clear, both in women and in men, that reproductive dysfunction is often associated with uh, added health risks later on, uh, mm -hmm. general health risk, uh, metabolic uh, conditions, cardiovascular decisions, uh, conditions. Uh, so it, reproductive health is, is significant for the individual way beyond reproduction way per se. beyond say. reproductive health, yeah. So we, we, and that's why we know from um, menstrual cycles that irregularities actually are amazing predictors for lifelong health problems and longevity in general across cardiovascular, um, neurological and bone health, our reproductive function significantly affects our overall health. And that is something that we definitely need to stop mm -hmm. isolating the two that that your reproduction, your reproduction, reproductive health should not only be important if you are planning to conceive or if you are um, um, yeah, if you're planning to conceive or even if you if you even if you've had children, I think there's a there's very often people find that if they're not planning on having children, they don't they don't regard their reproductive health, um, which they shouldn't. But from a medical standpoint, equally, you are treated more carefully if you're planning on having children. If you've already had your children or you're not planning on having children, it's less of a, an issue. Helen, one addition to that, uh, reproductive health, not indeed just being important for uh, reproductive potential and, and for later life health, but also now there's a whole new trend uh, developed in the last day called periconceptional medicine, which, which uh, uh, emphasizes that the health of a woman before she conceives is a very, very important determinant of pregnancies, pregnancy yeah. complications. Uh, health uh, of baby. Uh, exactly, healthy baby, and maybe even long-term health of, for children. Uh, so there are multiple reasons to improve reproductive uh, health, uh, not just to get pregnant, not just for long-term, but also for the offspring. Uh, yeah, reproductive health should not be a means to an end, which is a baby, it should be a means to overall health. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to take one one more question here because it's one that um, it's one that gets to me every time. Uh, she said, "Thank you very for your time. Very interesting. In the wake of the Thorano scandal, how do organisations overcome public scepticism about at home diagnosis or non clinic testing?" Um, that the Thorano scandal scandal is is to me the biggest scandal about that is the fact that incredible laboratories were set up and did not get used. Um, I think we can disassociate ourselves from them by actually having not just uh, gone to university but gone to secondary and, and tertiary university um, everyone in our entire organization has um, masters and PhDs and we are committed to real science as opposed to with the Thorano scandal where she left university she, she she didn't even complete her undergrad to do a degree it's done a massive harm I think to perceptions of being able to determine diagnoses from blood however um we i think i think we can hold our heads up and say that we have done everything by the board um and that at home diagnosis through these means we've done all of our systematic um we've done a, a concordance and clinical trials proving um the accuracy of our non-clinic testing and actually i i i think that 
we're smarter than that. I think people, as in you are smarter than that, people are smarter than that. And they recognize that um, certainly actually in, in the case of post COVID, we no longer, um, not only do we trust at-home testing, we expect it and rely on it. And I think we've, we've evolved from needing huge pieces of, you know, huge vials of blood in order to only take a small amount for a, a sample. I think the, uh, the future of health in general is, this neo neo clinic approach where you have at home testing and in the, in the in the case that you should need it you you go to a clinic but in the absence of true need every uh, digital tools are the the future of, of being able to diagnose people because at the end of the day doctors are 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 a tool in themselves in that they have to take in information using the information they have to decipher and give a, a diagnosis and i think there's a much more powerful way of doing that with, with a lot of data And then the second question they said, are you seeing women become more proactive than reactive about their fertility health already? Yes, certainly. We um, have been amazed by our data that though many people assumed, and, and I get it that we're called fertility and therefore people think we just do fertility testing, but you know, we are very much about reproductive health. And when we ask people why they're here, we ask, you know, are you just curious? Are you planning for the future? Um, i.e. maybe freezing your eggs or thinking about that. Are you experiencing symptoms? Or are you actively trying to conceive? And everyone said, you're only going to have people who are actively trying to conceive. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a huge majority are women who are just curious. And I think that that lends to acknowledging how innately curious we are about our fertility. Um, it's, it's something that if we don't remind ourselves, everybody else in conversation will at the various life stages um, that we have. Um, OK, great. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to just um, ask one more because it's uh, of your expertise is around hormonal birth control and asking if hormonal birth control is a contributing factor to fertility issues later on in life if prescribed as a young teenager and, and if adolescents have used it for several yeah. years throughout. An excellent and very relevant uh, question. Um, I think there is enough scientific evidence to come with a clear answer. Um, often reproductive dysfunction is hidden behind contraceptive use uh, because women with irregular menstrual periods, uh, they often go to a general practitioner at an early age, uh, late teenage years, and then uh, they are prescribed oral contraceptives. Uh, so they have regular bleeding. And when they stop 10 years later, usually their irregular pattern that they had before they started with resumes. Uh, so that is not caused by contraceptive pill use, but it's just hidden behind it. Uh, yes. It, it is clear that even long-term contraceptive use, steroid contraceptive use does not decrease uh, chances. It may take a little longer, uh, uh, a couple of months longer, but it does, do, does not decrease chances. Uh, and I think that's something that we, I, I still feel like that is we don't have significant data to make a statement about any one form of contraception i think we all we we have an over tendency to um put hormonal birth control into one or even contraception in general into one bucket rather than saying well there's you know combined oral there's non-hormonal and and for actually many women when you when you talk exactly about that can we track women in a linear progression across their lives to truly determine what the changes and what are the things that have led to more significant or aggravating changes we'll say mm -hmm. and when you ask any one woman you know what form of contraception are you on well they'll probably say that they were on this uh, then that and then this for a while and they had a terrible reaction to this one and so actually being able to quantify the true effect of any one given form of hormonal contraception is actually quite difficult especially when you know if we were to put a thousand women on the same form of contraception for the same amount of time and measure an effect but we've never actually been able to do that and what's worse is that we when when people come off their form of contraception then we're met with this confounding factor of well it could be just age and so it's actually quite difficult to get real truth data 
Yeah, because indeed the different, but you see, of course, an increasing use of IOD, which hardly was used in, in, in younger women at all a, a while ago. And also you see, uh, now in my country in particular, it, it was the country in the world with the highest proportion of young women using steroid uh, contraception, but that has been decreasing uh, that proportion every year. So steroid contraception, of course, is not without side effects, uh, nothing serious long time, but certainly affecting quality of life during a pill intake for quite a few women. Uh, and also, of course, the idea of taking hormones, using hormones for a decade when you're young is scaring more and more people. So they say, well, wh wh why continue? Let's look for other uh, uh, possibilities. And of course, IOD is one of them. Absolutely. Um... We are nearly at the hour and it's been so enjoyable just talking to you. It's very, it's very easy. And I could probably talk to you for a lot longer than just, uh, just the hour. Um, thank you so, so much for your time and expertise um, and support generally. It actually means it means a huge amount to me. Um, I, wish you, I wish you best of luck with your efforts. Uh, I'm a supporter. Uh, make it happen. Uh. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Um, and for anyone who um, is here, we'll be able to send out the recording of the webinar um, shortly. Once again, thank you so much, Professor Fraser. Thank you for having me. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.